Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Welcome Change, Ashoka's news weekly series where we meet social entrepreneurs from all over that are working on some of the most pressing social and environmental challenges that we're facing. We meet so that we can hear what they're working on, what's next, and the role that we can all play. So my name is Angelou Ezilo. I'm the founder, I'm an Ashoka Fellow, and I'm also the founder of Greening Youth Foundation. I'm the owner of Engage, Connect, Protect, a consulting firm, and the co-author of a book by that same name. And then lastly, I'm the co-lead for Ashoka Africa. I'm so happy to be joined today <laughs> by Aisha Yandoro in Jackson, Mississippi. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you so much. It's great to be in conversation with you this morning or this afternoon where you yes, are. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so <laughs> afternoon for me. So before we get started, though, because we have so much to talk about, I just wanted to kind of go through a little bit of a housekeeping for, for those that are, are tuning in. So we're going to be together for about 30 minutes. You and I will probably talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. If the conversation gets really good, we might try to push it a little bit more. Um, but then um, we're gonna turn to our audience for some of the questions that they may have. So for those of you out there, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you want to ask a question. So be sure to jot your questions down as we go. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Oh, but before, before we start, one of the things that I like to do, Aisha, is to call on our ancestors, our mm -hmm. ancestors that you know, have done so much so that we can be right here where we are today, but particularly our grandmas. I know that both of us have grandmas that hold a very special and dear place to us in our hearts. So let's call on their empathy. It was their entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. love for family, love for Black people, and for equal humanity and dignity for all. And if it weren't for our grandmothers, we both know we would not be where we are today. So I would like to say thank you to Grandma Aline. That's my grandmama. And how about you? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And that's such a beautiful way to start off the conversation. And in honoring ancestors, I would definitely like to call on my grandmother, Dr. Elsie Dorsey, who was a veteran of the civil rights movement here in the South and who taught me everything that I know about leading with your full heart and civic engagement and really addressing the needs of community in a systemic way. But then also, not an ancestor, but calling on elders, I have to also make sure that I honor my grandmother that is still with me. And that that is yes. Emma Barnes, who is my on your knees, praying elder of a grandmother who has never flown. But every time I'm on a plane, she sends me a text and be like, baby, I'm praying for you. Oh, and so good. I have one of those two. Mine is an auntie, <laughs> but I can relate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So mm -hmm. let, let's just let's just, you know, get started because it was so important to bring in that energy here because the work that you are doing is hard. It's hard, but I want to first start off by saying we're all so incredibly proud because you have designed and successfully implemented the longest running guaranteed income initiative in the United States. And I would have to say that this is at a moment where racial and economic uh, inequities are at a peak. Yeah. So what you did to unlock public and private dollars and are basically leading this, this national movement around this work sounds really like incredible, but it sounds also simple because you're just like invest directly in the people who are the most vulnerable and give them this cash assistance so that they can have this pathway to financial stability. But please share with us why this is not as easy as it sounds. Share your journey with us, please. Yeah, thank you for that. And you're right, Andrew, it sounds so easy on face value. But if you go back to 2017, when we first started thinking about this, about how do you just go about addressing the true issue of poverty within this country and addressing it with cash, um, it was not and it still isn't an easy idea. And quite frankly, that's 
of how we victimize poverty or how we criminalize poverty within this country. We make it seem as if poverty is an individual failing rather than a systemic failing and a policy failing, failing and a systems failing that we actually could resolve if we chose to solve by going about changing our policies and our systems. And if we were just being honest and on face value, the reason that we criminalize poverty so much is because we really we use this narrative that poverty is something that is experienced by particularly brown or black or indigenous individuals. And so thereby they choose to be poor. And so if we are not seeing ourselves in the equation of the challenges that someone is struggling with, it makes it very easy for us not to see ourselves in the solution. So when we started this work in 2017, I'm really dreaming about how do you go about giving Black women who are the most financially vulnerable in the context of this country, how do you go about just giving them the financial support that they need to actualize their dreams and have agency? It was difficult for a number of reasons. It was difficult because we have been the narrative that we tell ourselves about Black women in this country. It was also difficult because we do not believe that poverty is something that in, that we as a society should be uh, responsible for solving. Um, it was also difficult, quite frankly, because of who is the messenger. I am a Black woman trying to lead this work in the context of the U.S. South. So all of those were difficult wow. barriers that we had to go about overcoming to really just get people to zoom out and see the bigger picture and understand that when we are talking about addressing the issue of poverty, for Black women, we're actually talking about addressing the poverty for all of us, because as one ship rises, all of us benefit. And it was just a difficult reckoning for us, for individuals to begin to um, come to grips with, because uh, so much of it is so much of the ideal is related to narrative and so much of our narrative of how we talk about a thing is related to our values and how we internalize and how we ascribe to something or how we talk about it. And so it was, you know, it was a difficult concept. And to this day, here we are in 2024, we've had an entire pandemic where we have seen how financially vulnerable most of the society is, most of the world is, most of the country is. And it's still a difficult sale. It's still a difficult concept for us to wow. recognize that we can actually solve poverty just by giving people cash and trusting that they have agency. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Oh, there's so much. I, so, so my head is going in so many different places. It's so heavy what you're saying um, because you talk about shifting narratives and challenging people's value systems. Yeah. So talk about this social safety net, alleged social safety net that we have in the U.S. and the discriminatory beliefs that it's yeah. built upon. Um, yeah. You know, just some of the, the that people are personally responsible. Yeah. Uh, it's like a personal failure if you are struggling. Some of the things that um, we know are not true, but what yeah. so much is built on. If you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for saying so-called social safety net. It's not, because that's it's true. Not. And all, it's not. And I always say that the people's like, you know, the social safety net is not safe and it's not a net for individuals who are actually trapped in it. And, yes. you know, for some context setting for individuals who may not be familiar with our social safety net in the context of the United States, our social safety net is punitive. And what that means is that whenever your benefits increase or whenever your income increases, the support that you are receiving automatically decreases. There is a lot of um, bureaucracy as it relates to going about receiving those benefits. And I believe that the bureaucracy is intentional to make individuals have to continuously jump through all of these hoops to show that they are deserving enough um, or working hard enough for the support that they need to support themselves and their families. So it's a power play. For example, yeah. you know, if you are trying to get some benefits to help support your families as it relates to food, you may have to go and spend an entire day at the office of your caseworker just to just to fill out the paperwork, just to have the meeting. You now had to wait eight or nine hours in that mm. office. So in that time, you've missed time off of work. You've missed time with your kids. You've missed time doing the other pieces, other things of your day that you could have actually been doing. And I feel like this intention because it's a power play and it doesn't have to be that way. We live in a tech 
ecosystem where you can pull out your cell phone that we all have access to for the most part, and you can go about um, subscribing or having access to a myriad of different opportunities. Mm. Right now, I can pull out my cell phone and I can apply for a mortgage. Why do we not have the same opportunities available as it relates to our social safety net, where these are on a platform that people can apply for in the privacy of their own home? And so that's the way our system is designed. It's designed in a way, quite frankly, to keep people in their place. And it's designed in a way, quite frankly, to make sure that people do not recognize that they have power. And it's also designed in a way in which we are saying we are giving you these benefits and these benefits can only be used for this specific thing that we say these benefits can be used towards. So wow. perfect example, you may have received benefits as it relates to food and nutrition. And we are saying that you get $400 in benefits a month for that. Well, that can only be used towards, you know, milk or, you know, whatever. Well, what if your baby's lactose intolerant? What if you don't actually need to buy milk? You need to buy some other things for your child or some other, you know, type of supplements. You may not be able to use that with those benefits. So cash really is the way that we go about solving for those yeah. inequities that exist within the system, how it's currently designed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this problem, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about um, what makes your, cause this isn't the first time that we tried this as a country. I mean, I think you even indicate somewhere I read that, you know, Martin Luther King tried to do this and, um, and other countries are actually even doing mm -hmm. it successfully. Look at Brazil. So what makes this different? Like what makes Magnolia Mother's Trust, your particular model different? And what do you think why are you having such a such backlash here? Like, what's really mm -hmm. happening? Like, what's the underpinnings of? Let's talk about it, girl. I'm ready to go there. I know we got like zero seconds left, but <laughs> I want to talk about it. Maybe we need so, a yeah. part two. No, I love it. So you're right. So the ideal of guaranteed income, and for some level setting, um, guaranteed income is cash without restriction. So there are cash given to a specific population over a specific duration um, in a specific amount. It's not the same thing as universal basic income. Those are very different. So you're right. Guaranteed income and a call for guaranteed income is not a new concept. Um, President Nixon, as well as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and even uh, welfare activist Johnny Tillman, a mom way back in the 70s, called for a guaranteed income as a way to solve for poverty absolutely within this country. The reason our program, and also, you're right, guaranteed income or cash disbursements have been tried successfully in other countries for years. The reason our program is so unique is because in 2018, we were the first program in modern U.S. history to do a guaranteed income. And we were the first also to be explicit in saying that we were centering our efforts on the needs of Black women, Black mothers mm. specifically. So in doing that, we were calling out the fact that because of the racism and sexism that exists within this country, Black women have not been able to have an income rate at the same as their counterparts of either white men or um, white women, quite frankly. In this country, Black women make 61% of what white men make. And the story that we tell ourselves is that, oh, they're not working or they're not working hard enough. And it's not true. The, reaction, the reality is that the income gap, the racial wealth gap, how we go about actually compensating individuals for their time and the education gap have all come together to make it so where this population is exploited. Um, and so we were the first to say, we are just going to name a thing a thing and we're going to call out racism and sexism. And we are also are going to talk about the narrative that we have been so explicitly saying about black women and that that narrative just isn't false. That narrative is false, that narrative just isn't true. And that we are actually going to give black women who are experiencing poverty the ability to actually be the narrators of their own lives and their own stories. Mm -hmm. And so, because we always say the only way that we can change the narrative is by changing the narrator. And so the only way that we can do that is to make sure that Black mothers that are experiencing poverty are the ones who are vocalizing what their true realities are, vocalizing what it means to be a Black mother working against all of these systemic barriers and what it means to work and live in an ecosystem that is quite frankly designed to constantly try to rip away at your worth. We started yeah. this thinking yeah. about it in 2017. We successfully launched Magnolia Mother's Trust in 2018. As it relates to why we've had all of these challenges, I will 
okay. allow people to go ahead. But see, before you even get in that, you just you dropping all these pearls and moving quickly. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. because I know we, I know I'm trying to get to the point. I know, I know we're but on time. you cannot talk about intergenerational poverty in black folk and black families and just jump over that real quick. <laughs> we have to just quickly just touch on that because I think that that is so incredibly important because we often hear of you know, welfare, all these programs that, you know, that, that there, it's just something temporary. It's something like, you know, that you're going no. through that you'll get through so quickly as if it's not based in an, an yeah. a natural consequence of structural racism. Yeah. So no, it, it, and I think you're yeah. right. And I think that's because we all talk about poverty as if it's a monolith, as if there yes. is just one level of poverty. And so you're right. There is situational poverty where there is a, a bad life event happens and you temporarily find yourself in a moment of um, having limited financial resources and an episode where you're experiencing poverty. That's situation poverty. And then right. we have typically what it is that we see with Black families, um, and that is generational poverty. And that is where you are born into poverty. You know that you will most likely always be in poverty. And that cycle continues with your kids as well. And that is because that is baked into our system. We make it virtually impossible to exit poverty within this country. Mm -hmm. There is there's no yellow brick road out. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we are doing is we are systematically trying to attack the reality at two fronts. We are trying to attack it by first is giving people that basic thing of what it is that they need, which is cash, with trust and agency and understand that they have the freedom and dignity to go about their lives as needed. But then also we are addressing it at the system and policy level, saying that we know that we can actually go about changing these policies and all we, we need the data and we need the pushback on the narrative and we need the political will and advocates of, mm. to assist in that charge. Because the thing as it relates with policies and systems, people are always like, oh my God, they're so big, they can't be changed. Y'all, every system and policy that we have is because someone said that this is not we working. It. Right. Exactly. We can create it. We created it and we can create a new way in a way that we go we can exactly. change it. And the way we go about doing that is with advocacy and okay. making sure that and making sure that those who are quite frankly, the victims of these failed policies recognize their power and pushing towards policies that should be the norm and that humanize themselves and their families. So. Okay, okay. And I do want to revisit um, the whole political policy piece. But before we get there, one of the things I loved about what you're doing, Aisha, and I would say is something very unique, is the co-creation process that yeah. you do with the people who are the most impacted. So one story in particular that I love is that you said, so you're giving $1,000 to mothers who are like 200% below the poverty line. And the plan was to give them $1,000 for 24 months. Tell me what happened. Yeah, even I'll go back even before that, when we were even thinking about what, before we even got to the place of a guaranteed income or a Magnolia Mother's Trust, it really was born with this idea that we were already doing all of this amazing work within the community. So. Magnolia Mothers Trust, our guaranteed income work is housed. Uh, it's an initiative of Springboard to Opportunities, which is the larger organization that I lead. And Springboard has a community-driven approach to where we trust individuals to know what it is that they need for themselves and their families. And all of our programs, services, and activities lead with that lens. And that comes directly from what I learned from my maternal grandmother, Dr. Elsie Dorsey, who was a veteran of the movement, is that you don't do anything for people without having people involved. Involved, that are impacted by what it is that you're setting out to do. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And so when, you know, under the operate springboard has been operating for the last 11 years and within our first five years or so of operation, we I became concerned that in spite of all of these wraparound supports and programs that we were providing to families, we were not moving the needle on poverty. And mm -hmm. what that meant is that we were not seeing families 
exit these affordable housing communities that we work in. And that was important to us because our family said that was important to them. That, those were the goals for their lives, to actually own a home, live in market rate housing, not have to worry about somebody coming in and doing these um, checks within their apartment complexes and all of these things. And we became concerned that we weren't seeing that happening. Mm -hmm. And so since we are an organization that leads with trust and leads with the voice of community, we went out to the families that we work with and we simply said, we know that we're missing something. What is it? This was, at the time we were not setting out to do Magnolia Mothers Trust or Cash or any of that. And we this were just before setting out. COVID, this is yeah. This is in 2017, child. COVID oh, was somewhere baking. Okay. COVID was somewhere baking. This was in 2017 <laughs> when we were okay. thinking about this. And we went out and every story that we heard from families, they were not asking us to do anything different as an organization. They weren't saying we need more from you all or less from you all. They just were telling us the stories of their lives that, you know, oh, I am really stressed because my daughter made it to the next level of the science fair and I don't have the $25 registration fee to get wow. her enrolled. And I'm wow. trying to figure out how to do that. Or it was stories like, you know, I have a job, I, my car broke down, now I have to wait until tax season before I have the money to go about getting Get my car fixed. Road. Exactly, mm -hmm. so I'm having to depend on my cousin to take me to and from work, and that's really stressful. So when we sat down and we analyzed the data, we were like, all of these are pieces that can be resolved with cash and not a lot of money, just mm -hmm. a relatively small amount of money to go about mm -hmm. addressing the little foxes of life. And so that's when we started researching well, how do you just give people money? And right. since I'm a research by, researcher by training, that's when I got involved with all of the international research to actually understand that, oh, there is something out here already that has done this. It just hasn't been tried in the context of the United States. And all of the data at the time was saying, okay, it needed to be 24 months, at least $500, these pieces. But when we even started thinking about what it would look like to give moms money, I pulled together a round table of moms. And for six months, these women would just come and they would sit around our conference table at our office and we would call them dreaming sessions. Mm -hmm. And I was very honest with them. I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't even know if I can get it done. But if we were to design an opportunity to just give you money, what would that look like? And that's where one of the moms pushed back on the 24 months. It's like, you know, we really, I really just would like it to be 12 months because I don't want to become dependent on it. And so wow. everything about wow. the Magnolia Mothers Trust was designed by those women. I always tell people that, you know, I am just a vessel of this work. I am very yes. clear that this is community work. I am just very fortunate to have the seat of positional power that I get to talk about the work. I was the person that got to take all of the data that the community had given to me and put it into a plan. But this is not my brain, child. I was just a person there listening. Um, and I was a person willing. And I, let me say that again, because I think also people want to go skip over that a lot of times yeah. I was a person willing to listen and I was a person that understands the power of relationships mm. and when you are in authentic relationships with community not only do they trust you yeah not only do they trust you with their dreams but they also trust you with your challenges and I think that is so important for community Absolutely. social entrepreneurs to get that you have to have both in you have to be willing to step back and listen and be vulnerable yourself, allow other people to be vulnerable with you. Um, and of all of the things that I have within this seat that I, I love my job, it is amazing. But of all the things that I have within this seat of position of power, the relationship with the moms that I work with is the one that I value the most. And I consider it- I love it that so much, Aisha. And I think that that is so critical because a lot of times NGOs, have this like top down approach in which they go into communities and it, they just know they have all the answers for the community. And mm -hmm. I always say relationships move at the speed of trust. That's because right. If, you do, yeah. if, if the person that you're trying to help doesn't trust you, if you haven't put that time in, then it's going to go nowhere. So <laughs> I love that. I love what you're saying because it seems that you've been able to give just that bit that's needed to dream and as you indicated so that these mothers can can address some of the wants of their children and not just the needs all the time which to no. me is, as a mom I, that hit me real hard because you know that we're constantly trying to get to those wants 
No, and that's exactly right. And I think that was the piece that our very first year when we did this, that was the piece that honestly broke my heart the most as it relates to our data findings is that of all of the women that we work with, that are they are all moms. And I see how hard they're working and I see how hard they're working up against the backdrop of so many challenges. I always say it's like they're trying to move up a mountain of butter um, that's also covered in lard. So it's just like step by <laughs> step. I mean, slide down. I mean, this is like, good God, this is like butter on top of lard. How are you ever supposed to get up? And yes. these women did not see themselves as good mothers uh, mm. because of the fact that they could not say yes to some of the wants of their kids. Wow. And when I said, and I thought about it, that's I was like, you know, so this heavy. It's so heavy. And I was like, and that's, the, that's how capitalism works, though. It's almost like, that's a trap of capitalism. Trap, you don't see, yes. yeah, it's like, you don't see that you're over here killing it and thriving. And, Unless you, know, you can buy these things. Exactly. Wow. And, and I was like, that is the trap of capitalism that you don't even recognize how amazing you are because you can't say yes to some of the oh, ones. But I'm so giving, thankful for the time that you are just for what you're doing. And I mean, you're a doctor, you're, you, you have your doctor, you have all these things. Right. But for you to listen, to be a deep listener and to listen to this calling. I just, I just want to thank you, Aisha, because I know you. you could be doing anything, but your ancestors would have it no other way than you doing <laughs> exactly what you're doing right now. But, right. and I know we only have a few more minutes, so I want you to just share with everyone why you saw the pandemic as an opportunity. Because we were all paying attention. For the first time, we were all, we mm -hmm. could not ignore what was happening at a mass level. So it was the first time we as a society, as the world recognized how economically vulnerable individuals were. And we could not just say, oh, this happened to them across the, across the railroad tracks because it was happening to a lot of us. It was happening to our neighbors. It was happening to our family. It was happening, exactly, it was happening to our friends. And so it allowed for us to pull back that veil and have very honest conversations about how financially vulnerable all of us are. And that was an opportunity for us to begin to change the narrative on poverty. That was an opportunity for us to begin to change policies and systems systems within this country. That was an opportunity for us to have the stimulus checks, the child tax credit. All of those pieces were um, vital for us beginning to think about how do we in a real time effort shift policies mm -hmm. systemically. So yeah. Wow. And that empathy, you know, all of a sudden everybody had empathy because they were trying to do have action that would make a difference in other people's yeah. lives. You took advantage yeah. of that, which was great. So, um, and you testified on Capitol Hill. Yeah. How did that go? <laughs> How was that? Because I know the headwind of opposition is strong. It was so intense. I can only imagine. You know, it was intense when I was prepared and the elders and ancestors were with me. So it's all good. You go where you're called and you trust You were cloaked, prepared. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> With armor, so strong. I love it. I love it. So I, I, I would be. Um, I must ask you. Um, how do you? There's just so much negative energy out there. Like even people that you think are in your corner are constantly doubting you and, and questioning. Did you really do these things that you say you did? And you know, even the people who are liberal that you think should be right there with you yeah. have still a lot of challenges and things that they need to work on. So what does what does Aisha do for herself to make sure you are centering self-care in the midst of all of this? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so I take care of myself very well. Um, I, number one, I don't read comments. I learned that very early in this work that comments are where your soul goes to die. So we don't read those. <laughs> and I remember the very first, this is a sidebar, I remember the very first article on um, the national press that was written by Washington Post. And my mom was so proud, but then my mom called me because my mom was in the comments. And she oh, was she like, read the said, comments. I was like, mommy, I was like, you don't read the comments. I was like, you just focus on, you don't read the comments, you just focus on the actual article. But she was so upset. I was like, mommy, calm down. We don't read the comments. 
Lisa. Um, but anyway, I have an amazing husband who allows me to do this work. I have two little delicious black boys that I, I am raising. I love that you say that. You know, I got delicious uh, black boys too. Just what I'm saying. Two little delicious black boys that I'm raising that keep me centered. Um, I have my ratchet television that I probably should not be watching that is woefully problematic, but it allows me just to zoom, at, zoom out. And, hey, you know, everybody like, go watch some ratchet shows every now and then. And I will say, you know, shout out to Black Women Leaders. I also have an amazing network of Black women mm -hmm. leaders who I can um, lean into when I need to be poured into, who help me recognize who I am and whose I am and mm -hmm. why I'm doing this work. That. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aisha. So, you know, I think that there are probably some questions that are um, building up uh, from our audience. So let's take a look at them. Okay. Um, here we go. What signals are you seeing that we can channel more money into this guaranteed income effort? Are you finding public officials in Jackson to be receptive? And that's great because that gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about place and yeah. why Jackson, Mississippi um, is, is on the map. That's yeah, no, thank you for that. And so we're seeing a lot of reception at the federal level as it relates to a guaranteed income or cash disbursements within the Biden administration. There's an entire cash hub now that it's really just focused on looking at cash based policies and how they are baked in or not baked in within our social mm -hmm. safety net and how the social safety net can be transformed in order to make sure that more families have access to the cash benefits that they need without hoops and without restrictions. I will say that I am in Jackson, Mississippi, which is the heart of the Confederate. So as it relates to our public support, you use your imagination and you know what that looks like. When we started this work in 2018, I was always very clear that our aim was for federal policy. We were never looking at state policies because we knew that that would be probably virtually impossible for us to get the support that we needed at the state level. But at mm -hmm. the federal level, we could create a blueprint that could be replicated federally, but then also it would allow states that are more progressive and more liberal to begin to uh, innovate and toy with the model as necessary. So there is a lot of attractions in some states, uh, New York, California, um, even Texas um, that have had success. But just as we are seeing success at the, at the state level, we also are seeing a lot of anti-guarantee income legislation that is coming up. Here okay. in Mississippi, I will say that we successfully stopped anti-guaranteed income legislation from even coming out of the House committee. But we are seeing more and more attacks um, on the guaranteed income movement as they're beginning to recognize that the powers are shifting and that individuals who individuals are advocating and voicing for the needs for themselves and their families. So thank you for that question. For sure. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and I think we probably just have time for one more question from Irene. I love this question. She said, thank you, Aisha and, and Angelou, and thank your grandmas. <laughs> so cute. Um, so she says, what would be the best way to scale this to more women in the U.S.? Is that policy change? That is policy change. That's exactly right. So the way that we get to scale and the way we move from pilots. So right now there are over 150 guaranteed income pilots that are being run and some wow form or fashion within the United States. The way that we move from pilot to policy is with federal legislation. So that's how we get to scale. And the beauty of it is we actually now have a blueprint. We know what scale looks like. And we, not only do we know what scale looks like, we know the benefits of scale. The child tax credit that we benefited from for six months during the pandemic is a perfect blueprint, a litmus test mm. for what a guaranteed income will look like for most families within the context of the United States. And we saw that in that relatively short time of only six months, we cut child poverty in half. We had never wow. done that before. We have, I said, we have been fighting this war on poverty for over five oh my decades. Gosh. And in yes. six months, we cut it in half. So federal policy is Ooh. the way to go. And that's what we are continuing to advocate for. I love it. I love it. And I'm also thankful for those private dollars, whoever those yes. private donors were at the very beginning that stepped out of faith. They're yes. still there. 
Oh yeah, we you know all of our. I tell people, you know, I'm in Mississippi, y'all. So you know, Google Mississippi if you don't know what's happening here. We don't have any public support. All of our philanthropy, all of our resources for this work is private philanthropy. It's private. So it's all of our support is private. So each year when we are able to release a cohort of women, it is because private philanthropy still understands the benefit of what it is that not only that we're doing directly in the lives of the families that we work with, but also seeing the benefit of what it is that we're doing nationally as we continue to advocate for a guaranteed income at the federal level. Wow. Wow. And that same person, I think Irene also asked about internationally do you know where this is being done and i think you've already we've already talked about brazil as being an example of that That's so right. on that note i just want to thank you so much miss aisha thank y'all and this has been such um this was just good for my soul um thank because you. to know that there's somebody out there doing this work but that you have the support that you have the delicious boys and a, and a yummy husband and all the different things to support the work that you're doing. Um, and now you have an Ashoka fellowship. So you yes. know that's always here. Although in Nigeria, I'm across the pond. So I know well, you, we've already country. said I'm coming and I'm bringing my whole family. And, you know, okay. we got to, I thought okay. we got to stop, you know, we got to make a that. whole trick of it. Yes, I got to stop in Zimbabwe and see my folks. And I thought we're just going to make a whole continent. Yeah, you're going to have you to know? make a pit stop. That's I right. I got, I got the continent. space for you. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I also want to thank everyone for joining us. I mean, it really, I enjoy the questions. So thank you for sharing. And please, look out for the email from our Ashoka team that will be providing you with the link, a link from today's conversation. So thank you everyone and thank look you. forward to the next Welcome Change episode. They're always very engaging and interesting. Thank you all. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. See you soon.